You may have uh, noticed that this morning's uh, sermon title is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, you may have seen this uh, in the newsletter this week. You may have seen it on the front of your, your uh, worship folder. This morning's title is just simply politics. Immediately, some of you are leaning in thinking, ooh, this should be good. And you, you would be right. This is going to be really good. Uh, <laughs> others uh, felt their stomachs turn. Ooh, what is he going to say? And still so others are, are uncomfortable with talking about politics in a space like this uh, because it's been said that politics and faith shouldn't mix. There's a lot going on in our passage this morning. And so I, I want to try to state up front what uh, this morning's message is about. Politics. Whatever you sort of bring to that word is nothing more than the organization and distribution of power among people. Politics is simply about figuring out who has power? How do they get it? How do they use it? And how do they lose it? With that as our, our working definition this morning, um, I hope that you can sort of immediately see that, that politics is actually not, is not bad altogether, right? Uh, that if, if that's what politics are, about how power sort of makes its way among people, then we realize that politics is actually necessary, always, for any people who are going to live together at any time and in any place, right? It's, it's necessary because every single human relationship, think of all of the relationships that you have right now, friends and family and coworkers and, and uh, neighbors, all relationships are defined by some sort of power dynamic. The creation account in Genesis tells us that, that God made man and woman as equal, side-by-side -side forces for good in the world. Man and woman, equal in power, equal in standing, equal in shared purpose in the world. But... Genesis 3 tells us that man stepped beyond his God-given position and he named the woman just as he had named the animals before her. And in that moment of naming, he, he changed the power dynamic between himself and the woman, keeping human. Adam essentially just means human. Uh, keeping human as the name for himself. He then assigned for her a place among the animals, the mother of all the animals. So a good position, right? But no longer the co-equal side-by-side force that God made her to be. Everywhere that we see people assigning other humans a place of lesser status, a place of less importance, a place of less worth, we see signs of the curse. We see the brokenness of God's creation that God has been actively working to undo. Whether that is men lording their strength over women or women their importance over men. Whether that is certain Americans giving themselves a place of importance over any other group of people. Whether it's Christians believing themselves better or more deserving of God's blessings than anyone else. These are signs that the curse continues to be at work in our world and in our lives and in our communities. These are signs that politics, are nece politics is necessary because power is being taken advantage of by some and it's being used to hurt others. So, in our passage this morning, we will find David, the good and faithful politician. I don't know how you feel about David being called a politician, but this is what he is. 
He is navigating the power dynamics of uh, his own immediate relationships and those of an entire nation. And David, as the good and faithful politician, will not use his kingly power to lord it over his new subjects. David is going to use his power to serve and he's going to use it to bless and he's actually going to use his power to give power to others. Yet, as faithfully, as he faithfully carries out his his new role as king, David shows uh, himself to be a man who is still marked by the curse. In, In his early days, David refuses to demand that the people of Israel follow him. He knows That throughout Israel, uh, most of the people still have a deep and abiding loyalty to Saul. And so, in his earliest acts, you know what he does? He, He gives Saul's allies a choice to choose him as their king. He speaks words of blessing to them. He speaks words of honor to them. And he says, I will do good by you. Would you let me be your king? While David is offering Israel a choice, he also then demands that the wife that he left behind many years earlier be returned to him. A wife that has since built a new life for herself. Uh, He takes that choice from her. David's politics as king. Honor God as he serves and he blesses God's people, but David's politics as husband and father, as we'll read this story, end up destroying a number of lives. Politics is necessary. I said that at the beginning, but here's why. Because we are all in these relationships that are defined by power in some way. And politics is then how we organize ourselves in order to distribute power, whether that is in our households, who calls the shots, who is in charge, whether that's in our church, whether it's a state or a country. People have uh, mistakenly suggested that, that Jesus doesn't talk much about politics, but this is because people confuse politics for elected officials and campaigns and the broken machinery of the system and the bickering of government. But if we understand politics as uh, power, as who has power, how did they get it, how do they use it, and then how do they lose it, Jesus never stops talking about these kinds of things. And I want to suggest that the Christian faith is ultimately about Trusting Jesus as the king of a better kingdom. Recognizing that all power belongs to him. And that he refused to use that power for his own gain, for his own self-preservation. But he instead, giving up his entire life, uses his power to serve and to bring us life. This is incredible, right? He refused to use his power to dominate anyone, to control, to take for himself, or to protect himself. Instead, all of his power was put into sacrificial, self-giving, self-emptying love. And he looked at his followers and he said, go and do likewise. The politics of Jesus brought salvation to the world. The politics of Jesus lived out by his kingdom people continues in every place to restore and to bring life and to undo the curse. But it's important to point out that we are in a time of serious political transition. And I'm actually not talking about uh, November. Uh, I'm talking about the transition that the New Testament narrates between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God's own son. One kingdom, we're told, is passing away and the other is being established. This morning's passage, 
This story of political transition between Saul's kingdom and David's kingdom, it is utterly essential reading for us. If we are going to understand how we live in this world, how we are supposed to live in the midst of this kingdom transition, we need these chapters to reveal uh, what we're in for and all of the subtle temptations in the midst of it. I think especially as Americans, we desperately need these chapters. As a 32-year-old, I just have to admit, I've had it really good. Um, People around the world, in my same 32 years, have suffered more than I could ever imagine. I read about the suffering because I want to understand it. One of the things uh, that I've discovered is that in my 32 years, one of the, the core foundational reasons that, that many people have suffered has been their countries going through violent leadership transitions. Two years before I was born, it was 1981. Some of you might remember this. President Ronald Reagan uh, was in his first months as president. When he was shot. This is about the closest that we have come to a crisis in presidential leadership in 35 years. For a few hours after Reagan had been shot, uh, Reagan's vice president, uh, the senior Bush, was on an airplane and, uh, and essentially he was out of reach. Reagan's secretary of state uh, got a little excited and started pushing beyond the limits of his position. Uh, hosting a press conference where he announced that he was in control. Uh, You know how things go. But when the vice president landed, came to the White House, everyone, including the Secretary of State, fell into place, and everything moved forward as it had before. Even 60 years ago, when, when President Kennedy was assassinated, his vice president was nearby, and about two hours after Kennedy was pronounced dead, the VP took the oath of office with Kennedy's wife standing right next to him. I mean, in my life, I've experienced four presidential transitions. Three of those were from one party to another. I recently came across a note that the senior President Bush left for President Clinton on inauguration day, and it was gracious and, gracious and humble, and I won't read the whole thing for you, but it, these are a couple lines out of it. Dear Bill, I wish you great happiness here. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success now is our country's success. I am rooting hard for you, George. It was in the news just a few weeks ago that that, uh, President Obama, along with Congress, have, have announced in the works a significant transition plan being implemented, designed to help the next president be ready to govern on their very first day of office. I mean, there's a point to all of this that that I'm getting to, which is that political leadership does not always transition smoothly. And in fact, for most of the world, through most of history, it hasn't. Americans generally do not understand how terrible political transitions are and have been in most places and at most times in the world. I think if we understood, we would not be so quick and so eager to destabilize other countries. Um, We just would not find that to be a valuable move because political transition often involves incredible suffering, suffering that none of us have known. Our passage this morning is about this kind of transition. Saul, the king of Israel, he's been king for decades, has died. And David, God's anointed king, is ready to step forward. And this transition could have been smooth, but it's not. It's violent and it's dangerous. And it is exactly what Bible readers from other places in the world read and go, I know exactly what that's like. I know exactly what that feels like. I know exactly how 
messy and ambiguous and fearful this kind of transition is. I, I should say this, that the violence that we find in these stories is actually probably nothing compared to what, what might have been if David, knowing that he was supposed to be king, uh, had gone after the throne while Saul was still alive. David did not go after Saul's kingdom. This was a deliberate decision based on the kind of king he believed God was calling him to be. And, and David, in this refusal to grasp for power, is an important model for us. Because David's example lays the groundwork for us as we prepare to see Jesus go even further, as he refuses to cling even to his life. 1 Samuel chapter 31, we're given this grim picture of Saul's death. He's, uh, he's wounded by archers, and then he decides that he can't face the shame of being killed by his enemies. And so he falls on his own sword. He takes his own life. You know, Saul didn't write a note to David wishing him happiness and a successful reign. This was a desperate act by a defeated man. How different are these two deaths, Saul's death and Jesus's? Saul, so desperate to prove that he is in control of his life and the kingdom, fights to hang on to his life until finally he ends it by his own hand. And Jesus, in actual full control, uh, allows himself to be brutally tortured and killed while he shows a complete abiding trust in the Father. Hanging on the cross, he's more busy asking for forgiveness for those who put him on there than he is worried that he's going to be shamed somehow. Saul is so interesting, isn't he? <laughs> he had known for a long time that David was the one who'd been chosen to replace him. I don't know if you've ever had that experience in your life. You know that your successor and whatever you're doing is right there behind you, and every day you see them and you're like, I know that this guy's going to take my position. This person's going to replace me. It, maybe it's in work, maybe somewhere else. This is a hard experience for Saul. But more than that, his experience with David taught him something about David, about who David was. He knew David. And, and Saul could reasonably have expected that, that he and his family would have lived well under David. Just the other day, uh, I read an interview with uh, President Obama, who is ready for his retirement. And he was describing where he's going to, to live and how he's going to sort of settle into his retirement. This could have been Saul's experience, knowing David as he did. So David was not going to, to seek retaliation. He was not a man of vengeance. You could picture David serving as king while Saul settled into retirement with his family in Gibeah. Saul may have known David, but Saul also knew himself. And I think Saul knew what the kingship had done to him. I think he knew that the power had corrupted him. I think he knew what he had become over time. Because when we read Saul's early story, this is not who Saul is at the beginning. Something has happened to Saul as a result of serving as king. And maybe he feared that David would also be changed by the position. So that one day when David was corrupted, he would wake up and he would go, what's Saul doing here? And he would do the same sorts of things that Saul had spent his kingship doing, exacting revenge on his enemies. It's hard to know for sure what Saul's motivation here is, right? But Saul clung to control of his kingdom until the last moment of his life when he then attempted to take control even of that. As I think about political transitions, uh, I was thinking this week about organizations that have been established uh, 
specifically Christian organizations that are designed, intended, their purpose is to help churches uh, be healthy over the long term. And, and, and so one of the things that these groups are really interested in helping churches uh, do is make uh, leadership transitions well. Uh, let me start this by saying, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, that, the, Valley Community Church in Pleasanton, unless you make me go somewhere. Uh, but that would be another, another sermon. Um, Valley Community Church in Pleasanton recently went through a pastoral transition, and they... Uh, they worked with one of these organizations, and uh, some of you guys know uh, Pastor Danny there, uh, VCC's former pastor, uh, who was telling me uh, about what he was learning early on in the process. He told me that his research had made one thing incredibly clear. Healthy pastoral transitions lean almost entirely on the established pastor. The pastor's attitude, the pastor's posture, the pastor's actions, they are what set the tone uh, and make a healthy transition possible. What kind of power does a pastor have? How did the pastor get that power? How does the pastor use that power? And how does the pastor lose it? VCC just went through, just this last year, a beautiful and God-honoring transition because their pastor sought to honor God as he held loosely to the power that had been given to him. Saul, (laughs) because of his attitude, because of his grip on the kingdom, because of his behavior, made the transition to David as king incredibly difficult. Even in his death, Saul's attitude and his behavior made it challenging for for this transition to happen. See, one of the things that Saul did uh, was give people the impression that God's will can be thwarted. Think about it like this. For every day, for every week, For every year that Saul woke up in the morning and stood in front of the people as king, for every day that he stood up and said, I am your king, he showed people that God's will could be overcome by the will of a mighty king. Abner, Saul's general, one of the people closest to Saul, and Saul didn't have very many close people at this point, shows us that this is exactly what what Saul believed and what Abner now believes. Saul is dead, and David has begun to reach out to Saul's allies. David has begun to to make peace, working for peace, to invite Israel to trust him as their king. When Abner decides he is going to come along and consolidate Saul's loyalists behind behind one of Saul's sons, Our passage gives us this picture of Abner driving and moving the political machine in the north. Abner is the exact kind of guy we think of when we think politics. Right? (laughs) Abner has his agenda and he is working it until the moment when he becomes disillusioned with his own plan. Saul's son, uh, Ishbosheth, is not who he thought he was. See, Saul uh, may not have been a faithful king, but he was an effective king. He was the kind of king that Abner could work with. And if he could mold uh, Ishbosheth into Saul's image, this was something that Abner could, could run with. But now Abner sees clearly Ishbosheth is not somebody you could build a kingdom around. And he tells Ishbosheth, I am out. But what Abner says is amazing. The way that he explains this to Ishbosheth is utterly amazing. Because in the second, uh, in Second Samuel, chapter three, verse nine, Abner tells Ishbosheth this. Uh, chapter three, verse nine. He says, "I will accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him: to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set it up and set up the throne of David." Abner apparently knows God's will, but he seems to think that God's will is like minor concern when you're working out your own will. That is until God's will and his own will align. Verse 10. 
This passage is so messy. It is so messy because David wants peace. But David wants peace because this is God's will. But Abner also wants peace, but because it's his own will. Peace at this moment in the story is in Abner's best interest. And so Abner becomes a peacemaker. Abner has found a way to take advantage of the kindness that David generally shows to his enemies. By becoming a peacemaker, Abner has now arranged for himself a position of power. In Abner, we see a man with incredible power. We've seen this play out, actually, the same story in the Middle East over decades now. The same power dynamics, because Abner is a general. He has held control of Saul's armed forces. And in a power vacuum, generals wield a ton of power, right? Because who says no to the guy with the guns? And it gets violent because the moment a guy with guns starts calling the shots, anyone else who might uh, have a claim to the throne suddenly needs a guy with guns to defend themselves against the other guy with guns. Joab, Joab becomes a mighty general with ridiculous power in a world shaped by a king who refuses to give over the kingdom. And by Abner, a general fighting to keep Saul's kingdom for himself. Joab, David's general, finds his power because of Saul and Saul's general. So that when Jesus says something like, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. He is speaking to this historic, universal truth that violence never ends violence. It might momentarily halt it, but violence always plants the seeds of future violence. This this is a a fun, depressing uh, combination of of ways to read the Bible sometime. If you're ever doing a year read through the Bible, is to go, I want to see what violence begets. What what comes of violence? And just start at the beginning and keep working your way through and you will see that violence always plants the seeds of future violence. And this is the story that our passage this morning tells, right? Two generals face off and they decide to make a game of it. If you read it this week, you, you, you go, what is happening here? It's, it's a game. It's entertainment for these generals, essentially. Uh, and this is not unheard of uh, among militaries in, in the ancient world. They set their great warriors against each other in a competition. Winner takes the kingdom. It's not that different than, than what's going on with David and Goliath. Of course, violence never works this way. And so the the entertainment warriors die and the generals can taste the blood and the death then of a dozen turns into the death of a commander which turns into a prolonged battle where hundreds die which results in a revenge killing. All of this leads the people to hold a a popular uh, misunderstanding of who David is as king. See, because David, at the very beginning of his reign, already showed us what kind of king he was going to be. The first thing that David does as king is seek God and pray. The other thing he does is demonstrate justice. He is a king who will seek God and who will rule justly. If that's the case... That means that revenge killings, assassinations, they have no place in the kingdom of David. David proved this at the beginning with his response to Saul and Jonathan's deaths. When Saul and Jonathan die, uh, most of us as readers of the story have the same reaction that uh, my daughter had this week. Uh, as we're reading it during the daily worship guide, I go, Saul dies this week. She goes, yes, finally. Uh, <laughs> I go, ah, huh, that's, no, 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 that's, <laughs> let's read how David responds. Uh, when they died, David did one thing. He lamented. 
He grieved the loss of their lives because even though Saul spent his entire kingship setting himself against David as his enemy, even though Saul tried to kill him numerous times, David refused to treat Saul as his enemy. Even though Saul had become so shriveled and and pitiful as a human being by this point in his life, David treated Saul with the dignity of a human person filled with the image of God. This is powerful. This is the kind of king that David is. But his own general, Joab, has a different reputation. He uh, is busy building a different kind of reputation for David. See, because he takes over David's army, and Joab has a different message than the one that David has been sending. David's reputation built by Joab is one that the people can can get behind. They're actually pretty ready to rally behind it. And so our passage ends with more violence. Surprise, surprise. But it ends with two guys. And they they had served Saul's son, Ishbosheth. And the story unfolds. They come to Ishbosheth's home while he's asleep, and they kill him in his bed. And then they take his head, and they bring it to David, ready to boast and gain David's favor, ready to find a position of honor among David's, uh, in David's court. Any other king, and these two men would have been honored, they would have been paraded through the streets as loyal servants, but David wasn't any other king. David wasn't Saul. He was a king after God's own heart. He was a king who showed how deeply he trusted in God's power by refusing to use his own power to enhance his position. One of the challenges that we face in the midst of political transition is how to use our power for the good of others. How to use our power to bless others. And the other challenge that we have is how do we live when we don't have power? David has already shown us in all of the chapters leading up to this, his time in the wilderness, his time in Saul's court, his time in the wilderness, his time beyond the wilderness. This is, those stories were how you live without power. But now, He's showing us what it looks like to live with it. And our passage sets David uh, and Abner side by side in order to show us the politics of peacemaking. Right? David knows that he is king, and so he offers peace to his enemies because that's what you do when you serve God. You offer peace to your enemies because that's who God is. God is is the one who offers peace to us while we were still his enemies, giving us his son. But Abner, Abner makes peace only when it's convenient for him. But he still makes peace. I don't know what to make of that. (laughs) But I do remember Paul's instructions in Philippians when he said, some preach the gospel for their own ambition for their own reward. But what do I care? The gospel is preached. Maybe there's something there for us. But our passage doesn't just set David and Abner side by side. Uh, Our passage also sets David and Joab side by side to show us the politics of living with Jesus as king. David knows that he's king. And so he serves God He does justice, he walks humbly, he seeks God because he knows that he's king. Joab somehow got the impression that his job is to make David king. But David is already king, right? David never gives him this job and God never gives him this job. Joab is the self-proclaimed kingmaker. It's worth considering how often we think that it's our job to somehow make Jesus king. 
And does it make a difference in the way that we live if we just trust Jesus, trust that Jesus is king and seek to follow him and live as his obedient citizens? Or if we are somehow attempting to uh, put Jesus in power in a way that he never did or asked us to do. As we think about Joab, uh, Joab for us, becomes one of the most dangerous people uh, in our lives. Because Joabs are ready to give their lives in service to the true king. He's on the right side, right? But on his terms. Joab serves his own agenda. But while doing it in the name of the king, Joab's build their own name and reputation behind the king, in service of the king, but they still have a place. They still have power that they are grasping for and hanging on to. Uh, Eugene Peterson describes the Joabs of our world as the worst enemies that we could ever face. See, our, like, obvious enemies, the ones who are, like, outside of the kingdom, uh, those, those enemies are easy because we know where they're at. We know what they're doing. Like that's, that's cake to deal with. We, just, we pray for them, love them. That's, that's good. Um, but Joab's, these are rough enemies because they sound like they're our allies. They claim to be with us and for us. But at every step along the way, they seem to be ruining the reputation of the king, fighting for the king's name in ways that the king never asked them to fight. How much devastation has been done in the name of Jesus between nations, within nations, in churches, and in homes. As Jesus walked confidently toward his death, he gathered with his disciples in a garden And it was there that a group of armed guards came to take him. And one of his disciples thought, I will fight for Jesus. And he took up the sword. And Jesus rebuked him. As he had Peter earlier, Jesus rebuked him. As David did Joab, when he spoke of the harshness of the sons of Zeruah in that garden, Jesus facing death, facing a threat to his kingship. The disciples wanted to fight because that's what you did to establish a kingship. But Jesus declared, that's enough in the Gospel of Luke. And I want to suggest something. That in every place and at every time since that moment, everyone who has taken up the sword in the name of Jesus, has taken upon themselves the mantle of Joab, the one who doesn't understand the ways of his king, the one who fights for the king, who's on the right side, but misses it because the king says, lay down your lives. When the two men come, uh, with the head of Ishbosheth to David. They're expecting praise and honor. <laughs> and David looks at them and says, What's wrong with you? Don't you remember? We've done this before. Do you remember what I did to the guy who, who came announcing that he had killed Saul? Uh, do we remember that situation? You should. That is what you should have heard about the kind of king that I am. See, it's interesting. David expected his citizens to know the kind of king that he was. And Joab, as his general, had been tarring that, uh, that image, that reputation, by his agenda, by his actions. Jesus expects us to understand the kind of king that he is. And, and this is why, uh, here's my, my open comment, this is why we come to the table every single week. This table reminds us the kind of king that we serve, the character of the king that we serve. 
the teachings of the, of the king that we serve. This table orients us to who we belong to and what he's called us to do and to be. But more than that, the table equalizes us. How many times does Jesus talk about his banquet table and, and make sure that we understand that nobody is deserving of a place of honor above anybody else? The table equalizes us. Paul, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, begins to chastise a church harshly because that community has, has played, uh, played politics that are very different from the, the kind that Jesus has, has taught his people as they begin to sort themselves by, by economic class and who is more deserving of, of a fuller meal than others. This table becomes for Paul in his letter to the Corinthians a call to, to come back to the kind of community that Jesus has formed. A, a table where all of us, every single one of us belongs and has a seat and has been invited to share in God's abundance. None of us has a position above anybody else. And it reminds us that Jesus was always saying this kind of stuff. When the disciples thought that they were somehow better than a Samaritan town, uh, because they had accepted Jesus and were following Jesus and, and they hadn't. Uh, he says, what are you doing? You're not supposed to lord it over each other or anyone else. I've called you to lay down your lives and to serve. This table reminds us who Jesus is and what he has called us to. He says, look at my life. Listen to my words. Go and do likewise.